<laughs> Good morning from Canada, everyone. I know it's not morning in every part of the world for those of you who uh, are, are not in this part of the globe, um, but we're thrilled to have you here today joining us for the third webinar panel, I believe, um, for the Commonwealth Tribute to Life program. And the focus for today is actually uh, an introduction for promotion on national campaigns. And before I tell you a little bit about that, um, perhaps I'll have uh, both Tom and I will introduce ourselves as the panelist chairs. Uh, my name is Catherine Butler, and I am the director of the Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Program with Canadian Blood Services and a proud uh, supporter um, and member of the Commonwealth uh, Tribute to Life uh, Initiative. Tom, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Billiard. I'm a critical care physician in Coventry in the UK. Uh, and I'm the clinical lead for organ donation in the Midlands region uh, of the UK. Um, I'm a relative newcomer to the Tribute to Life campaign, but I, I attended the launch event and was very, very impressed by everything I saw and was fascinated to hear tales from around the world. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what everybody's been up to. That's wonderful. Um, we are going to introduce our two panelists, uh, Holly and Brianna, very shortly. Uh, but before we jump right into uh, the presentations, um, to give you a bit of uh, um, background on what this session is about, uh, the focus for the panel is really about uh, approaches to national campaigns um, for organ and tissue donation with the public in order, as most folks know, to improve organ and tissue donation um, rates in our respective regions. Um, I I think and expect that the conversation and the discussion is going to be an opportunity to share ideas, to even do some problem solving together if that comes up, uh, and help us look at the various challenges that are faced by some of the jurisdictions and organizations in promoting some national campaigns and the work that that involves. Um, and I'll take this moment to actually identify that you'll see me in what looks like perhaps a bit of an informal um, hockey jersey. And no, it's not because I'm necessarily a huge Canadian hockey fan, um, but a April is actually the, um, the main month in Canada in which we do our organ and tissue donation and awareness campaigns, uh, transplantation campaigns. And specifically tomorrow is Green Shirt Day in Canada, which is a huge day for us. Um, that celebrates the legacy that was left by a young man named Logan Boulay, who um, tragically died in a, a bus crash uh, several years ago, um, but who prior to his death was really adamant and a huge promoter of being an organ um, donator, uh, of donating his organs um, post-death. And so his family have done much incredibly great work to continue to ensure that his legacy lives on in our country and because of that we've seen the effects of 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 um, a huge increase in organ donation rates be just because of that one day so we celebrate that here I know today is April 6th so I'm cheating a little bit and wearing this shirt but um, it, it's in spirit of the of the session today so Tom I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce some um, our panelists Okay, thank you very much. So we've got two panelists today, um, Holly Mason from the UK and Brianna Elms from Australia. Um, but we're gonna start with Holly. Um, so Holly is head of marketing uh, for all the organ donation side of NHS blood and transplant in the UK. She worked for, for the organization for, for 15 years now. Um, a lot of that spent on the uh, blood donation side but about five years ago, we were fortunate to have her move over to the organ donation side of the, uh, of the organization. And she's worked on two of our major national campaigns, uh, including the Pass It On campaign and the Leave Them Certain campaign, which I'm sure she will tell us more about in just a moment. Um, so Holly, I'm really looking forward to hear what you've got to say and, and to inspire us with the UK campaign. So over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Catherine, for that introduction as well. I'm just going to get my slides up. So just bear with me one moment. So hopefully they are now sharing. Can everybody see those slides? Brilliant. So I'm going to take you through um, two of the national campaigns that we've delivered um, here in England. Um, we have had an evolution um, of national campaigns over the years. So Yes, I Donate was our campaign to drive behaviour change when the system for organ donation in England was opt-in. 
And the aim here was to motivate people to register their decision on the NHS organ donor register and share it with their family. In 2019, we then launched our Pass It On campaign to inform the public that the law around organ donation was changing to an opt-out system in 2020. The law in England is actually known as Max and Kira's law. Uh, Max received a heart transplant uh, from his donor, Kira, um, and really campaigned hard for the opt-out uh, legislation to come in. So the, so the law itself was named both after Max, and it was really important to Max that the name of the law also reflected his donor as well. So it's now known as Max and Kira's law. And then last year, we launched our latest campaign, which is the Leave Them Certain campaign, which again focuses on motivating people to make their decision known, but this time an opt-out system for organ donation. So we've gone from a very pro-donation campaign with yes I, don't, yes, I Donate, to a neutral campaign to deliver the law change. And we're still promoting choice. Um, so we're slightly more pro-donation pro stance than the law change uh, with the organ donation graphic. So first of all, I will just touch on the uh, campaign to uh, drive awareness of the change in law to an opt-out um, system. So we had an obligation to reach as many people as possible to inform them of the choices available to them. So through audience insight and testing, we developed the Pass It On campaign, the meaning of which was threefold. So it was to encourage the public to pass on more organs to save more lives, to pass, to pass on their decision about organ donation, and also to pass on to the law was changing so we could reach more people. What was really clear from the research is that people really wanted to know why the law was changing to help save and improve more lives, what the change was, and what they needed to do if they didn't want to donate. So that all informed our messaging. And the campaign creative, which you can see on the right, was our organ-shaped balloons. These are actually CGI balloons. We didn't produce any for environmental reasons, but it really symbolizes the gift of organ donation and passing on uh, of organs and people's decisions as well. So the public awareness campaign, it launched in April 2019 um, to inform the public that the law was changing. Our plan was to increase the level of activity as we got close to the law change. However, due to COVID-19, all our activity was paused on, 20, on the 20th of March 2020. I think the fact that we'd launched our campaign over 12 months in advance of the implementation put us in a really good position, but we still needed to, in, to support the implementation of the new system on the 20th of May. So rather than have our multi-channel paid media um, campaign running, um, due to COVID and the need to have the messaging, the government messaging around uh, public health, um, we decided that we would just issue a, a media release, um, which was supported by radio advertising and extensive stakeholder engagement. We'd seen quite a lot of misinformation circulating in January, so we made the decision to use really trusted sources to deliver our message rather than sources such as social media where things can easily be easily be kind of misunderstood and quickly circulated. The campaign did resume uh, from Organ Donation Week in September 2020. Um, with the national paid media advertising resuming slightly later in November. And the real purpose of this was to reinforce that the law had changed and remind people that they still had a choice and could still record uh, and share that choice, even though the law had already changed. And then in February 2021, we launched our new campaign um, to drive action. So this slide is really just a snapshot of the first year of the Law Change campaign. So you can see it was a really comprehensive multi-channel campaign. It's probably obvious, but it's more effective when all channels work together to deliver the same message at the same time through a multi-channel campaign. And um, we always see that has a really, really big impact uh, at increasing awareness. Paid media and PR were essential for reaching the mass population and new audiences. We needed to reach as many people as possible. And our stakeholders, partners and community investment scheme amplified our campaign and really acted as trusted messengers, whilst our own channels on social and our website provided a really clear user journey for people. 
And the campaign effectively drove an increase in awareness, which has actually really remained fairly stable since we introduced the law change, which is really positive to see. So just a, key, a few key learnings from this campaign. So despite a pause in campaign activity due to COVID-19, the campaign effectively engaged the public and increased levels of awareness of the law change. Launching the campaign 12 months in advance really helped with this. Whilst the campaign was successful, the law change in itself has increased inertia. So those who are in pro, who are pro donation, so in favor of donation, now feel that they do not need to take any action in order to donate. Therefore, our ongoing, ongoing campaign activity will really focus on encouraging the public to share and record their organ donation decision. Messages containing incorrect information were set, shared on social, but mainly via WhatsApp, which is actually really hard to detect and track and intercept. So stakeholder support was really key in managing misinformation circulating within specific communities, which drove a real spike in opt-outs. An awareness of the law change and willingness to donate amongst Black and Asian audiences remains much lower than the total population. So this is a long-term challenge for us that we continue to ingress, address through specific community engagement and via funding trusted organizations within communities to raise awareness, educate and address barriers to donation. So I'll now move on to talk about our latest campaign, the Leave Them Certain campaign. So as I mentioned, whilst the law change campaign was successful in informing the public about the change to a new system, Unfortunately, that has in increased inertia. So those in favor believe they do not need to do anything if they are happy to donate. So in, in England, we introduced a soft opt-out system, uh, which means that the families will always be consulted before organ donation goes ahead. And we know that nine in 10 families support organ donation going ahead if they know what their loved one wanted. So now that we have communicated the change in the law, we need to drive action amongst those who are willing to donate to support and uplift in consent rates to help save and improve more lives. However, before I get into the Leave Them Certain campaign itself, I'll just touch more on our audience insight that's informed our strategy. So previously, we segmented our audiences by demographics alone, such as age, gender, or ethnicity. However, these groups are not homogenous and to effectively engage and drive action, we need to understand our audiences in more detail, their attitudes, behaviors and values, as well as their demographics. So when budgets and resource is reduced and restricted, we need to ensure that our activity is really tailored so it's not only effective, but also efficient. The analysis we carried out identified six segments, which range from extremely pro-donation, with their attitude being to organ donation, it's a no-brainer, why wouldn't I? That's the generous and engaged segment on the left-hand side, through to those that we will never motivate to donate, and with their attitude being, I don't want to, and I don't feel, feel guilty about it, those being on the right-hand side. So there's a real spectrum of support and willingness to donate for organ donation. There are four sizable segments where, due to their attitudes and values, there is the possibility to generate a positive decision and a positive registration and conversation about organization. So those are our four priority audiences, the generous engaged, the quiet and caring, the young and wary, and the conflicted values. And the decision to be a donor is not a linear process, but for the purpose of showing where each segment is in the donor journey, each stage follows in succession. This has really helped us to identify that each segment is in a different stage of their donor journey, has different barriers to overcome, and therefore requires a different approach. The key marketing and communications for object, objective for each segment is outlined, which needs to be addressed to move them along their donor journey and drive action. So this is a very busy slide and I won't go through it in detail, but this is just to show how that insight has informed our strategy. So we've used the Combi model of behavior change to develop our marketing strategy. This behavior change model identifies three factors that need to be present for any behavior to occur. People need to have the capability, the opportunity and the motivation to be a donor. And this has been mapped out at each stage of our donor journey, willingness to donate, recording a decision on the register and sharing 
uh, their decision so that we understand what barriers we need to overcome by audience at every single stage to motivate people to take an action. Some of the factors are the same per segments. Um, for instance, to give people the capability or the confidence to share their decision, we need to role model that behavior. But for each audience segment, this needs to be delivered by a relevant trusted voice. So the strategy is the same, but the implementation will vary. So now on to our latest campaign, the Leave Them Certain campaign. Um, so what does Leave Them Certain mean? So our research told us that people don't want to leave their loved ones to have to face a decision around organ donation without knowing what they have wanted. So people were really motivated not by their need to share their own decision, but by the thought of leaving their family in that difficult decision. So the research told us we have to motivate people personally uh, and really inform them of the role of the family. We need to prompt. Organ donation, unfortunately, isn't, a top of, isn't top of mind for most people day to day. So timely media and role modelling are really important. And we really need to give people the confidence to have that conversation. It's not a conversation that everyone is immediately comfortable with. So we wanted to reframe it as positive and important thing to know about each other and give people the tools to go to do so. So the combination of all these three areas will help drive behaviour. The campaign was actually developed prior to our audience segmentation, so we'll now work to tailor the overarch and leave them certain campaign to the needs of the different audiences. And our TV advert, um, which you can see on the right there, is the story of a real life donor family who didn't know what their loved one wanted in that situation. Uh, it features real footage of the donor throughout their life. Uh, and then ends with the uh, an actor playing the son being asked if they knew what their loved one's decision was. So it's a really powerful and um, impactful advert, or we like to think so anyway. So what does this look like for a national campaign? So Organ Donation Week is our key moment of the year. Our Organ Donation Week uh, falls in September and it's the point in the year where the whole organ donation and transplantation community come together to celebrate the gift of life. The main objective for Organ Donation Week was to encourage people to share their decision. So through PR and advertising, we motiva motivated people to talk to their loved ones through real life stories and explaining the role of family in donation. Through advertising on social and through our extensive network of supporters, we prompted people to talk about organ donation. And you can see some fabulous photos there of in England, uh, our colour for organ donation is pink. Um, so lots of buildings across the country lit up pink uh, for organ donation. And then through paid media partnerships, celebrities, influencers, partners, and our own channels, we gave people the confidence to talk about organ donation by showing others doing the same and providing tips to start the conversation. And I just really wanted to touch on a couple of really innovative formats we've used, uh, which really drive attention and worked really well. So we worked with Snapchat, so that's the first one on the left, to create a Snapchat lens. So this actually uses body scanning technology. It identifies where the organs are in the body um, and then displays interesting facts with the ultimate call to action being for those using the app to talk about organ donation. This generated 25.8 million impressions, so opportunities to see the lens. It led to 720,000 shares, reaching an additional 1.3 million users, surpassing Snapchat, uh, Snapchat's ben benchmarks. Um, so it was a really engaged with um, format that we used. And we've also worked with Candy Crush, a gaming app, and we created a bespoke game that users had to play in order to unlock a reward. So the game is in, in the style of the ca Candy Crush games, with users having to match candy-shaped organs be, before being served our message. And the engagement rate was four times higher than their benchmark for Candy Crush. So really kind of taking our message and uh, creating it in the look and feel uh, native to Candy Crush worked really well. And then finally, we've developed a YouTube mini series called Cooking Up a Conversation. So this involved influencers cooking a meal together whilst talking about their life and organ donation. So really role modeling the behavior we want people to take. 
We know that the conversation about organ donation is more likely to take place in the home. So while cooking their favorite dish felt like a really great fit um, for this series. And the series has actually achieved over 1 million views, views on YouTube and the influencers helped us to reach new audiences. So just in terms of what organ donation delivered, um, we saw great support from the media, our partners, stakeholders and supporters, which led to an increase in web visits, registrations and conversations. You'll see from the graph on the right that the challenge does really remain in order to increase the percentage of people who have shared their decision. So that's why our focus now is on more tailored activity to our augment audience segments uh, where we can really be effective in our messaging at the right stage of the donor journey. Um, so we believe that's where we can make more progress. So just finally, just a couple of learnings from our national campaigns. Um, so audience insights, the more targeted we can be, the more effective and more efficient our marketing and communications activity will be. Registrations are really, for us, driven by partner registrations. They deliver a huge volume of registrations for us. So we work with the likes of the DVLA, the Driving Licence Association here in England, um, which has a, um, a, a registration option at the end of the DVLA driving license application process. And we've also had great success in working with the NHS app as well, building that into the user journey. Conversations through our research, we've learned that they're typically, typically promoted by a personal, so a personal um, situation such as someone passing away or a personal um, connection to someone that's had a transplant or a situational trigger. So seeing something in advertising or in the news and it takes place in an environment of emotional safety. And what we mean by that is a, a place, to, typically the home, uh, where people are unhurried and have the time to sit down and talk to their family about organ donation. And I'm sure as everyone knows real life stories are incredibly powerful and motivating and the messenger is really key so individuals and organizations and organizations even are really key in building trust for us and normalizing organ donation and finally representation is king so we we need to be inclusive in our mass media showing diversity and tailored community engagement is just not enough um, and that's what you'll see through our Leave Them Certain campaign, in particular our national TV advert, um, the story was of a um, family of Asian heritage and that was important for us that um, we make sure we include a diverse range of stories in all of the activity that we deliver. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, Holly. That was fantastic. And uh, clearly some really great stuff that's been happening and some learnings from that that um, I suspect the audience is going to find incredibly helpful. Um, I think, and I'm not sure if I'm doing this correctly, we do have some questions that are coming in, but I'm wondering perhaps if maybe, um, uh, Tom, if you're okay with this, if we go to Brianna and then the questions coming together are, I think, are probably relative to both um, presentations. Yeah. And then maybe we can we can bundle them at the end and you can each have an opportunity to speak to some of them. Does that sound okay to you? Okay. I think, yes, I think that's a good idea, Catherine. Okay, Tom, I'll hand it back to you to introduce Brianna. Lovely. So, yes, we will now hear from uh, Brianna Elms. Um, Brianna is coming to us from Australia. So good evening, Brianna. Um, evening. So Brianna is the National Manager for Communications and Engagement um, at the Australian Organ and Tissue Authority, a post she's held for the last 18 months, working on national programs for raising awareness of organ and tissue donation. Um, she has uh, worked elsewhere in the Commonwealth, having uh, a background of having worked in the NHS in London um, before uh, returning to Australia, um, and has had a, a long background in working on uh, change agendas, of particularly digital engagement. Um, so I'm going to be really interested to hear about the differences and similarities in campaigns uh, in Australia to the UK, and um, particularly one thing that, that all of us have, have seen and, and wondered over um, how you managed to turn the Sydney Opera House pink, because that was a particularly uh, impressive 
uh, piece of imagery. So um, over to you, Brianna, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. It was great to hear from you, Holly. There are definitely a lot of similarities, but also probably some scale differences in what we do. Uh, and you'll probably find as I work through this presentation that a lot of it is uh, goodwill that we are very reliant on in, in pulling off things like lighting up our opera house magenta. Yes, it's not pink in Australia, very clearly magenta. Um, let me just, I know I got, I got caught on that on my first day by calling it, I said, you've got a really strong brand color. It's beautiful, you know, the pink and then, oh no, it's, it's, it's magenta. So let me just share my screen with you. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Terrific. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about Donate Life. Uh, Donate Life is the Australian government's brand to raise awareness about organ and tissue donation. It's also our brand that we use for organ donation in Australia. So uh, it's, a, it's a federated brand that is used all across Australia. I want to give you a little bit of background on Donate Life Communications um, and the shaping of the Australian program. We're a new program. Donate Life has only existed uh, since 2009. Um, last year, in fact, we celebrated our 10-year Donate Life Week anniversary, which was very exciting. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about the impact of COVID on our strategy and what that meant for our activities. Um, and then get to sharing a little bit more about our Donate Life Week campaign from last year. So just as a bit of background for everyone, uh, there was a national reform package in Australia pre-Donate Life um, that set up a lot of expectations about what needed to be done. Um, compared with many developed countries, especially some across the Commonwealth, Australia's donation rate was fairly low and it remained so despite numerous publicity campaigns um, and interventions on our side. Uh, the reasons were not necessarily clear, um, but what was clear is there needed to be broader uh, continuity of service across Australia. Um, and numerous community surveys and public camp awareness campaigns also told us that most people supported donation um, and would want to donate their organs and tissues after death, but they weren't having their conversations with their family and they certainly weren't registering their intent. Uh, the Australian Donor Register was established in 2000 um, and it was established as a national register. And prior to this in Australia, uh, most Australians registered their intent through driver's licenses. So these were all operated separately in all the different and terms across the country. Um, in 2005, there was a decision made to integrate um, to, us, to integrate driver's licenses into the National Register, which did see a lot of uh, registrations being brought together. Uh, that process took about six years. So between 20, 2005 and 2012, um, that process of integration into data systems happened in Australia. There was a lot of data lost in that process. So we found that in some jurisdictions, um, they had a zero base really when Donate Life established um, with their registrations. So you'll often hear us um, in our communications asking people to check their registration because if anyone's any older than me, mid thirties, they assume that they are registered because they registered as a legacy through their driver's licenses, which actually no longer exists in Australia, except in one jurisdiction of South Australia. But just for some context, uh, in 2006, there were 800,000 Australians on our register and by the integration of the driver's licenses system, there is about 35% of Australians on our national register, um, which is about 7 million people. So uh, we've got a population of around 25 million here in Australia. Uh, our national program. So uh, 2008, all governments agreed and endorsed a reform package um, with the aim to make us uh, implement a world's best practice approach to organ and tissue donation. Uh, the Commonwealth, which is who I work for, we run a national program with two streams of activity. Uh, we run the clinical program in the jurisdictions and we drive community awareness and stakeholder engagement across Australia. 
Um, and our states and territories are responsible for the delivery mechanisms in our health system. Uh, here's a little bit of context for you about the breadth of, and the depth of our country. So um, to fly from one side of Australia to the other is the equivalent of crossing the entire Europe continent. Um, geographical challenges implementing a national system that you can imagine will amplify during COVID, organs needed to cross borders, healthcare is the responsibility of the territories in Australia, which means that uh, there was different rules and regulations around COVID restrictions and they all needed to be created um, in order to keep our program going. But I will continue to tell you a little bit more about that as we go. Um, in order to establish our community awareness program, we do quite comprehensive research. Uh, and I think there's probably a lot of similarities between what Holly has said, but I did want to touch on a few of those. Um, I guess the first thing is to reinforce that overall, mostly, overarchingly, there are only 1% of Australians, and we still have to now, who are willing to donate um, organs and tissues, um, and very few that are unwilling to donate. Um, in fact, last year there was a survey done which again re established that four in five Australians are certainly willing to donate their organs. Uh, in terms of their motivations, those registered said saving lives and helping others were behind their motivations. Um, many not registered but were still very supportive, identifying a disconnect between intention and action, and that's something certainly that we try and uh, we try and tackle in our public communications. And um, most did not discuss donation in depth with their family, um, which would we know that would also increase consent rates. So when we established the program, we launched a national brand and logo. Uh, it was an interesting time because it was the bringing together of many separate entities that were doing their own engagement programs around raising awareness around organ and tissue donation. So there is a lot of co-branding in our relationships. A national Donate Life network was established in the community engagement space. And so I do have a network of um, marketing expertise and, and stakeholder engagement and community engagement staff in all of the jurisdictions that work closely with me. Um, work started on a website which launched in 2010 um, and we kicked off a, no a national week campaign in 2010 and that became known as Donate Life Week in 2011. I guess you're asking what the size of the team is to deliver on this remit. I think this is probably where Holly and I differ quite significantly. Staffing has varied over the years, but at the moment, my team at the Commonwealth level, we are, there are five of us, and we have a network of around five to seven in the states and territories who support that. So we are obviously really very reliant on external parties, on ambassador programs, on partnerships that we have with the community, and the uh, beginning of the program was very heavily focused on grassroots engagement and activating a very strong network of advocates that we have around organ tissue donation in Australia. I just want to flip to present day and uh, just reflect on the progress that has been made with the establishment of the national program. Uh, over 15,000 transplant recipients from 5,500 donors. Uh, we've seen 16, over 16,000 eye donors and over 35,000 tissue donors deceased since the beginning of the program. As, and in context, we'll be looking at those numbers and seeing that they're probably quite low. This is kind of the trend data for organ and tissue donation in Australia. You'll see pre-national program there that it was fairly steady. Uh, the program established itself, like I said, in 2009. Um, the community awareness program began in 2010 and we, we have seen since that time around 120% increase in um, recipients and an 80% increase in donors. You'll see at the end there that COVID did have an impact on our program and we've seen about a 20% drop in both um, donors and recipients since um, the emergence of COVID in Australia. 
So jumping back to our first Donate Life Week campaign, uh, was a financial uh, push on this campaign, so it was fairly comprehensive. Um, it's funny to look back over all of these campaigns and I'm going to run you through a, a few slides just to see how um, community perceptions change over time and what messenger works, you know, and even from five years ago, it, it certainly wouldn't work now. Um, I mentioned it before, but I just want to reinforce that the origins of my program and our program is in community engagement activity. So in that first year of running a national OK campaign, there were more than 300 events across Australia um, run with our support. So we run a grants program that we still run today um, and um, act activating community members at a, at a really a, a local level. This helped us um, establish a bit of a strategy, a push and pull strategy. So nationally we would target more mass audience reach I mean, there is segmentation that happens there, but then locally it would be delivered um, very specific to community groups. Um, and this was particularly useful and still is actually around our First Nations people. So our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cohort here in Australia, as well as our culturally and linguistically diverse Australians. So nearly 50% of us are um, either born overseas or we have a parent who was born overseas. So that's a really important audience for us. Uh, like I said, Donate Life Week established in 2011 um, and over the next 10 years, they have mostly been organic campaigns that have been run out of um, us as a government agency. There hasn't been a lot of financial push by them, but every year it's kind of a different take, um, a different focus, different uh, objectives and certainly different, <laughs> different kind of ways of, you know, we need to be and, and our strategy for that year. I'm just going to run through them because it's it's it is quite funny. Uh, we had a bit of a genie in a bottle moment. Um, we did do something really interesting in 2013. We, uh, we got religious leaders in Australia to um, sign up to a charter um, indicating support. That was a certainly significant barrier um, to our called audiences um, taking that step of registering. Uh, 14 and 15 ran again, um, 16 and 17 there was some a little bit more money so you'll see a bit of a change in the look and feel as we go forward. 18, 19 and 20, this was an, these were interesting years. So 19 was the year that we lit up the house. Uh, so 19 was also a year that we had um, pretty, pretty significant partnerships. We, uh, for those of you that know Australia, all know that um, the South Half of Australia, well, actually, a few of the states are very avid Australian Football League fans. Some of the other states are very avid uh, rugby fans, and there is some tension between those two codes, depending on where you live. Um, and we had partnerships with those codes in that year, which really um, certainly elevated what we were doing. But it was certainly fun uh, launching 2019 at the Opera House. 2020, we had to pivot significantly for COVID. So our national awareness camp runs in July, uh, the last week in July, although uh, it's never a week, it's more of a three month campaign that we run. Uh, and in 2020, I think probably up until about May, we weren't sure whether we were running Donate Life Week, which was very interesting. Um, but as a result, uh, we made a move to the digital space, which hadn't really been explored before, which sounds strange. It certainly was utilised, but it wasn't optimised. Um, and what we saw as a result of that is uh, a lot more evidence in the decisions that we were making because we were able to track all of our activity that previously uh, was almost outsourced for us to these community partner groups. Um, so it, it, it kind of saw us significantly move that of uh, the intent behind Donate Life Week um, in what it is what is it was last year, which we're into and what we're going to continue to do going forward. So last year we ran uh, the great registration rates for Donate Life Week. You will see as I run through all the other kind of look and feels that we moved away from our standard kind of corporate branding and we gave this a unique look and feel um, with a new call to action too. So 
we were up against the Olympics in this time frame. The Olympics ran all through our campaign. Um, and in addition to that, like I said before, um, we were strengthening our COVID pivot. So this was a digital campaign for the most part. Registration race uh, to spark urgency behind encouraging people to join up onto the register. And we also set a goal. So we hadn't done that before and we made it public. So we we were looking for 100,000 new registrations on our register. Uh, this, by the way, was a lofty goal for us. It was about a 50% increase on our best ever campaign prior to this time. Um, so yeah, we were looking for 100,000 new Australians to become organ and tissue donors. Uh, and this challenge formed part of our narrative that there was 13 million Australians eligible to register as organ and tissue donors, but haven't taken that step. Uh, the great registration race was also about asking people to check their registration, which like I said before, a lot of people um, had assumed that they were registered, but weren't because of that uh, driver's license process that happened at the beginning of the national program. Uh, we did this with a lot of support. Um, so we have new money to uh, establish the partnerships from government. Uh, so we have partnerships with sporting community and advertising groups that we hadn't had done before. Don't know if any of you notice any of those logos. You probably won't, but they're significant partnership model here in Australia. We also had another round of community partners, which if you'll recall, I've, we've been running since the beginning of the program, but they were much more targeted last year. Um, particularly targeted to be able to be used together and again they were focused on our hard to reach Australian groups so our Indigenous people, our called audience groups and our young people too so predominantly people aged 16 to 25. Uh, the rollout of the collateral was lots of fun actually uh, you know it was interesting because there was a bit of resistance to this campaign in the beginning that needed to be overcome particularly within the sector and within our advocate networks that were used to something different um we had uh, key activities included targeted tv we did have a small amount of um made paid media by this year um, we did paid socials um, we did an ambassador outreach program the guy in the middle there is a footy player of one of our partnership teams um, and, and like every year, we had the really unique privilege of telling some remarkable stories, um, you know, those love, loss, resilient, hope, gratitude stories that we get from donor families, from transplant recipients and from the staff and the volunteers that we work with. Um, I think we really maximised too the partnerships that we had within the sporting in particular. Um, and we use them to extend the reach of the campaign into Aussie homes that had low and no awareness about organ and tissue donation. Uh, we also used an audience segmentation strategy before um, and target those Aussies with uh, likely to be on that register. So there were about, um, there are more than 300 unique pieces of design work that was done for this campaign four times what was ever done previously so we definitely scaled up the impact of this campaign um, we ran a speaker campaign across cafes in Australia and activated our volunteer network in that way where they couldn't be out and about because we were deep in lockdown last Donate Life Week um, we did a lot of activations with the national media partner here in Australia um, our pretty significant social media campaign, billboards, lift wraps, all sorts of things. It was um, very diverse, segmented, and it tried to target people in lots of different ways. Uh, just quickly on social, we ran kind of a, uh, an organic campaign, let's say, but it was encouraging people to join our movement. Um, there were lots of people that got behind this campaign we started from the top with our most influential um, ambassadors and worked um, from there. And we had some beautiful stories that we also shared last year. Uh, the finger up is in, it, it's in reference to the fact that it only takes a minute on our channel um, to register as an organ and tissue donor. It's the right finger, it's not the middle finger. 
Um, just quickly in regards to media for Donate Life Week last year, um, we did have a lot of paid placement, which was um, also new for Donate Life um, and really saw pretty significant results. Um, we had kind of a three phase approach to our media placements. Um, we focused on in inspirational stories, um, inspiring people through med tech, through partnerships and ambassadors. Last year was the 20 year anniversary of um, Victor Chang's um, passing away actually, but he was quite a pioneer in the heart transplant world here in Australia. Um, we ran a, quite a significant um, piece on across social and paid media um, because we do find that busting those common myths about organ and tissue no donation is really effective. Um, and we also led fairly for the very first time we released registration data. So um, we shared data by local government area and almost generated competition through the release of that data. Um, I think what we knew that we were going to be in a really crowded media landscape with the Olympics. Um, we were able, with long lead time and short lead time, significant um, deliver significant coverage that we hadn't seen before. And we reached a, a, a more than a half a billion of um, people online and our print, radio and TV advertising last year. So what G for us? I mean, there's more than we measure than registrations, but I think that's probably something that you that is most easy to understand. So in 2020, we made a quick pivot to digital and we were very locked down because by COVID, we achieved 57,500 registrations over the campaign period. And last year we doubled that. Um, so we achieved our goal of over 100,000 registrations, which was a massive pat on the back for everyone involved in that campaign. Um, and to put that into a little bit of context, we also had um, something that sort of fortuitously happened as a result of COVID that we piggybacked off. This is our, uh, the Australian government's uh, Medicare service app. Uh, and for people that needed prove their vaccination, people had to download this app and they had to uh, access their um, vaccination certificate. And if you look there on the left on the homepage of the app, right under immunisation history is organ donation. Uh, where previously and in previous years, uh, people accessing this app was actually a barrier for us, it became an opportunity uh, because people had to access this app. Um, normally this, this process is like a two-step verification. You need to have your Medicare card, you need to say who you are. So not a lot of people held this app, but because of the need for a vaccination certificate here in Australia, a lot of people were jumping on board, which um, was fantastic to see. So where did we end up at the end of last year? We ended up with 186,000 new Oh, sorry, in 2020, we ended up with 186,000 uh, registrations, which was a normal year. And last year, we um, increased that by 87% and achieved 350,000 new registrations. So this is, um, as at the end of 2021, uh, the Australian population, how many of them are on our register. So it's 36%. Uh, for those playing along at home, you may recall I said a very similar number at the start of um, the national program. So we have we have seen growth, obviously, in new registrations, but we've also seen population change. So it's all kind of balanced out. Uh, you may notice in the middle there, South Australia at the bottom, that has a significantly higher registration rate than our other jurisdictions. And why is that? That is because dr uh, driver's licenses still exist in South Australia where they were removed in all the other jurisdictions at the start of the national program. And like Holly said, there's not a linear way to map registration to consent rates, um, but I am gonna show you the same map again with our consent rates here in Australia. So our consent rate last year was 56%. People that said yes in population, you will see South Australia's consent rate is quite high and higher than other jurisdictions. So there is a connection there to registration and consent rates, especially in South Australia. 
Um, we know that nine out of 10 times um, our data shows us that people will say yes to donation um, if they are registered and this drops to about four in four and a half in, in 10 times that say yes if the family doesn't know what they want. So where to now just to finish up? How do we continue to increase registration rates and family discussion through public awareness here in Australia? Well, we have a short term, we have short term goals and, and objectives, but we also have long term. Um, in the longer term, I guess what I would say is we need to affect change at scale here in Australia. And that requires um, some investment in the program. Um, and certainly we would like to see a goal of up to about 50% of the Australian population as registered organ and tissue donors. Um, and of course, we're you know, exploring conversations with government about how best to achieve that. Um, and I guess in addition to that, it's not just registration numbers, um, it's part of a much bigger effort to drive best practice improvements here in the program. Um, as well as all those other contributing factors to increase the number of families that say yes in the hospital setting. Um, I guess another thing to say is we certainly look to our international colleagues um, who are ahead of us in the policy world and, and certainly in the maturity of their program for their evidence and their data on best practices and what we can implement here in Australia. And, and it's really exciting to life for setting better connections with us to do that. And I'm thrilled to be a part of this for that reason. Uh, in the shorter term, what we're trying to do with the program here in Australia is uh, certainly um, continued investment in our digital platform and our digital campaigns. I've only touched on Donate Life Week, but there are a lot of other things going on in our space. Next week, in fact, we're running a dedicated social media campaign on iron tissue donation. Um, we're doing some work around um, young males in gaming platforms um, that will launch during Donate Life Week, where 92% of Australians aged 18 to 24 are present. Um, and we've done some successful Valentine's Day campaigns on dating apps, uh, which was an interesting discussion to get across the line, let me tell you. Uh, in addition to that, we've still got really strong um, a push and uh, a privilege actually to work in the partnership and advocacy play, um, space and um, that up. And I guess the backbone of all of that is making sure that we're really and um, we're continuing to make evidence-led decisions here. So, um, today is an interesting day for me and my team. We've just come off of two days of um, the initial workshop for Donate Life Week 2022 and what we're going to do in our space. And you'll all be pleased to know that Donate Life Week occurs over the Commonwealth Games this year. So we don't have the Olympics, but we do have the Commonwealth Games. So we will be running um, the second year of the Great Registration Race here in Australia. So it's really exciting to see what we can do to build on that success that we had last year with that campaign. I think that's all. Thank you for listening. Brianna, thank you very much for, for your presentation for both of you. Those were excellent. And uh, it certainly generated uh, a number of questions. I think, you know, I have, and I know that the, I suspect the audience has as well. Um, and uh, so I'm fascinated, Brianna, at some point, I'm going to have to have a conversation with you offline about your dating app, <laughs> the experience with that. That sounds yeah. fascinating. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, also to take, take um, comfort in the fact that the Commonwealth Games are also going to be play a big role with the um, kind of the, the formal public launch of the Commonwealth Tribute to Life campaign. So you've got a bit of company in terms of that this year and, and perhaps uh, it might actually be more of a help than a hindrance. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I wish you best. It will be bright. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, so um, we have some questions recognizing that uh, um, the session is supposed to be about an hour, but we're not married to that for sure. And so we may have time to answer a few questions, but um, uh, Holly and Brianna, one of the um, 
uh, questions that came forward and both of you flagged it. Um, and I think it was a big theme in the in the presentations. And that was really the experience of COVID that you were kind of geared up to go to some big events and then boom, COVID hit. And because it was a global phenomenon, I think that there's probably quite an interest to know how has your experience of COVID influenced you're thinking about future campaigns in both the UK and Australia, I, I, in terms of how you would approach that um, going forward. Do either of you have any thoughts on that? Who would like to go first? Sorry, Holly. Do you, do you want me to kick off? Um, yeah, so COVID hit right in the middle of our law change campaign. So that was uh, really challenging for us. Um, we, continue to measure attitudes and behaviours um, towards org donations through public surveys. So that's one of the key things that we will continue to do to just measure the impact and, and how people's attitudes to organ donation are impacted by COVID. We've actually seen um, the support and willingness to donate has remained fairly stable uh, in England, which I think is really positive given everything that everybody has gone through. I think we also saw great levels of support from families for organ donation, um, particularly during the first wave uh, of COVID as well. And we've seen great support for, for the NHS and people wanting to do more to help support their communities. I think for us in England, one of the real challenges going forward will be um, our working, engaging Black and Asian communities. They've been disproportionately impacted by not only COVID, but by transplant, uh, organ donation and transplant as well. And that's where our community investment scheme, so the organisations that we fund to deliver activity within their communi communities will be really key. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got, we've just launched the fourth round, we're just about to launch the fourth round of our community investment scheme. Um, so building in that kind of feedback loop is also going to be really important. What's happening within those communities and how can that information help us to make sure our future campaigns are sensitive, are tailored to everybody's needs. Um, but yeah, it also just means we, we, COVID has definitely shown that we need to plan and potentially uh, have backup plans as well. It was a very, very challenging time in terms of looking at what, what we could do instead. But I think we've learned so much from it that we're in such a better position. Um, should something like that happen again, hopefully not, um, that we're, we're definitely more well prepared to kind of flex our activity uh, and yeah, divert to digital activity and things like that. So lots of learnings, but um, still some challenges going forward, I think, to answer that. Excellent. Thank you, Holly. Brianna, was there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think in a similar way, there were absolutely a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. I think, um, you know, we were, uh, we've, we've done our performance reporting for last year uh, recently. And um, like I mentioned to you, we had a drop in donation and um, transplantation rates, but we had a significant increase in registration rates. So we were sort of a little bit of a silver lining story in what was an incredibly difficult year uh, or two years. Um, Australia was kind of fairly slow. Um, we looked at all of our international colleagues and thought, gosh, when are we getting out of this lockdown business? And it really didn't happen until earlier this year. Um, so it's been an interesting time of, of pivoting, I guess, for our program. We were actually also impacted by workforce issues fairly heavily. Uh, so I will try and start my video. Uh, so we had a lot of staff needing to go and support um, COVID communications and marketing activities that needed to be stood up really quickly. Um, so that was certainly a difficult thing to manage and it still is. There's still a lot of requirements for um, public health messaging and finding kind of space and also workforce in that space is um, an ongoing challenge for us. Um, another thing um, about the importance that was placed on community engagement and grassroots activity in our program, you know, that's still not back to normal. And I guess there's a bit of responsibility that we have about protecting our vulnerable volunteers who are for the most part um, transplant recipients. 
Um, and they are not, they're still not in a place where they're comfortable going out and about for events, although our um, New South Wales team are at our Royal Easter show this week or for the next two weeks that they're really excited about. They haven't done an activation in two years. So it is slowly starting to come back. But um, I guess I can't, um, you know, there's certainly the move to digital for our campaigns in particular and um, the insights that we gathered off being able to measure um, the work that we were doing through those channels has been um, significant for our program and for our strategy and for, um, you know, wh where we want to take uh, the program as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, both of you. And Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you. I think you have a question. Okay. Yes. Um, so one thing that's been asked in the question that uh, particularly interests me, both of you have talked about um, the use of, of personal stories from, from organ recipients and their families and donor families as well, um, and the power of those messages. Do you, ever, do you think there are ever any downsides in using those personal stories? Holly, do you want to go first again? Any downsides? I don't, I don't think they are they're so powerful we can we can put out our advertising everywhere uh and our messaging everywhere but it's that it's that personal story that somebody connects with um so that's why it's important that we share a range of stories both on the donation side so it normalizes organ donation uh and on the transplant side as well so people can see i could help somebody just like this um, I can't think of any downsides. They, they really are the kind of the heart of what we do. And the, in terms of the media, the media coverage, we wouldn't get the level of media coverage with, with, if we didn't have those stories. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I just see them as positive and beneficial. I mean, people are at the heart of our program as well. We, we wouldn't have anything without the stories that we get to share and, and making that connection between what we're asking people to do and, um, you know, and, and, and connecting to those stories of impact. Uh, absolutely, we, I don't think we'd see any success without them. Uh, there are, I guess, a few challenges to running a program that is centred around those stories. Access to them is one for us. Um, so uh, accessing to the transplant units, we don't necessarily, it's not consistent across Australia. And um, we'd love to see more representation in our stories, but sometimes um, it's difficult to find those stories to be able to share. And I guess the other point about it is that we're incredibly protective for good reasons with our stories. And um, the time that we spend looking after those stories and those people and keeping them a part of our community, it's, it's a lot of work. And um, balancing that with, you know, mass media marketing objectives is a tricky one. Um, but that balance is the right thing to do and it's absolutely a, a positive thing. So um, Look, it's 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 fun. It's fun working in this space, that's for sure. And it's it's lovely to be so connected to impact as well. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, maybe we'll have time for another question. Um, Holly and Brianne and Tom, are you all okay to stay for another question or two? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, just I one of the things you did talk about was um, both of you had some data in there around um, kind of that spoke at a high level about uh, some of the impacts of the various promotion campaigns and national campaigns that you've done. And I suspect that one thing I know certainly in Canada that we struggle with and many campaigns struggle with is really getting a measure of how effective a particular promotional campaign was. And I was just curious to know if, if either, either of you are able to speak to how in general you measure the effectiveness of your promotional campaigns and your national campaigns, and if that's evolved at all um, in the last few years. I'll let Holly lead. I feel <laughs> like her story is going to be more impressive than mine. <laughs> It, it definitely is a challenge to measure. Um, there's so much activity that we deliver as well. So we 
we have various ways in which we measure the effectiveness of our campaign. Our ultimate goal is at the moment conversations, which is the, the toughest to measure. So we use a, um, a survey to measure that amongst the uh, population in England and Wales. Um, so it's just an indication. We're never going to be able to ask everybody in the country, have you had that conversation? Um, so that's one of the real challenges. Um, but the survey definitely, definitely gives us an indication as to how well we're performing and whether that trend is going upwards or downwards. It's a representative sample at a tie, at a point in time. So obviously, when we see it go up and down, people, it's not necessary that people have forgotten that they've had that conversation. It's a, at that point in time. So it, it, it is tricky to measure. An easier measurement is definitely registrations. Uh, and that is also something that we track as well. And then in terms of whether the campaign's been effective, we've got different measures. So we look at things like, for instance, for the, the media side, the PR side of things, we look at how many articles were published, how many people did we reach, uh, how much, uh, what percentage of the messaging was on message. Um, so the, there are metrics that we can use to see if we what we delivered um, was in effective. Um, the difficult thing is measuring the impact. With all the digital activity, very easy to measure in terms of what was delivered. Um, and surveys as well through paid media activity. It, paid media advertising has got really clever. So with the Candy Cross activation that we did with YouTube, the media owners can deliver surveys that can see whether people have seen our adverts, uh, and what they thought of our adverts. So there are some really clever uh, ways of measuring activity, but yeah, impact is definitely the hardest to measure. I, I mean, I have a, I guess I have a similar story to tell. We do a lot of benchmark activity. So like Holly says, we do place in time and keep the kind of parameters the same. And then we measure whether that's gone up or down or what's changed and why has it changed? Um, I guess uh, we do a lot of work in our space around um, behavioral insights too, and closing that ga gap between intention and action. Last year, we did a really significant project on attitudes and behaviors for young people. This year, we'll move that slightly. Um, again, um, there's a lot of surveys that happen here and um, it's fantastic to have partners with really advanced analytic programs because that is very helpful to us. And we kind of bring all that together and, and share it back and kind of work out where we want to tackle things differently. Um, you know what happened last year actually is a bit of another COVID consequence that worked in our favour is we popped QR codes on everything um, and they worked very effectively. So we could see where people were moving around. Um, and, you know, uh, QR codes were very cool a few years ago, but they are very cool now. Um, in Australia, every time you go into a, a, a restaurant or a cafe or a supermarket, you need to check in. Well, you don't anymore, but for a long time, that was the behaviour that was encouraged. Um, so people were checking in and becoming organ and tissue donors too, which was great, which was great and very measurable, which was nice too. That is excellent. That's and that's great information too. I've picked. I've definitely picked up some uh, some nuggets from that for my own team going forward. Um, uh, Tom, uh, I don't know if there's if you have any more questions or if we think we should call it a wrap. Uh, I think it's probably, uh, given it's nearly 10 past, it's probably time to call it a wrap. It was fascinating to hear from both of you that there were some positive sides to COVID, which um, perhaps we, we haven't thought about over the last couple of years, but um, particularly, it, um, Brianna, it was really interesting to hear about the way that the app has really helped you in, in Australia. Um, the, in the UK, we, we had apps as well, but they were very, very separate and it, it didn't have that, that link to, to organ donation. So it's, yeah, I, I've really taken that as an interesting thing. And yes, like I said, it's really good to hear that there were some uh, positive things to come out of COVID. So thank you. So um, th thank you both of you again, Holly and Brianna, for your time, for sharing your expertise um, with our system partners today. And uh, we appreciate your participation in this session and we hope that the audience does as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.